All rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good afternoon. Thank you for your courtesy. This is the time set for oral argument in our case captioned uh, Karen Grubaugh versus uh, Respondent Judge Blomo, uh, Andrea Lawrence, the, the Hallier Law Firm, and, and other uh, real parties in interest. Uh, our cause number 1CASA15-0012. Uh, we've allotted 20 minutes per side, as you know. Uh, if, uh, if each of you, when you argue, would state your name for our record, please, we'd appreciate it. We have reviewed the facts and issues and conferenced the case, and we're ready for your argument. And let's see, I think I have some additional... Yes, uh, we have a motion pending. Let me say this without, uh, without encroaching on anybody's time here uh, very quickly. We have a motion pending that we haven't ruled on yet to permit the filings to be under seal. And we're not necessarily convinced that this is justified to be under seal. So we invite each of you to take 30 seconds or a minute, not long time, to tell us why you think it ought to be under seal or whatever you would like us to know in that regard. And we'll, we'll make that decision pretty soon as well. Having said all that, uh, please proceed. This is uh, Mr. Briggs. Yes, may it please the court. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Briggs. I represent Karen Grubaugh, the petitioner in this matter. I have divided my uh, oral argument into two broad sections, one covering the legal issues and a second covering the factual issues. According to the response, it seems to be uh, some confusion over the legal issue of whether the mediation statute uh, applies in this case and whether the trial court uh, applied it or found a waiver to that that uh, particular statute. And that is the first point of error that we respectfully suggest the trial court made in not finding that the mediation statute applies in this case. In his minute entry, he plainly said that it is not applicable in this instance. Um, but, but, if, but if it does apply, if, if we agree with you that it applies, what's the result? Are, are you able to, is your client able to sue the, the, the lawyers uh, for all allegations relating including those relating to the mediation? Yes, I believe so, because I've... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead and answer this question. Yeah, I believe so, because I believe the attorney-client privilege and the mediation privilege are, are overlapping or parallel privileges, where one privilege, the mediation privilege, may bar or preclude the mediator from testifying. The waiver of the attorney-client privilege by virtue of the filing of the lawsuit would allow the litigation to proceed to discover all those comments and conversations between counsel and client. But is it, I'm sorry, Judge, you were going to ask something. Well, okay. I, mean, I can many, referee if I need to. <laughs> that's a, okay, thank you. you uh, the, first you, then you. There you go. That. That'll work. All right. Thank you. Oh, let me understand, to make sure I'm going to set a premise up for my question. Let's assume, as Judge Gamble said, that we agree that the statute applies to this situation. Um, and my understanding is that as part of the malpractice action, not the entire malpractice action, but as a part of it, you and your client intends to testify as to what the attorney, as a Ms. Ms. Lawrence, right? Correct. Did or didn't do in advising her for the mediation and during the mediation. Now, it's not your entire claim, but that's part of it. So you intend to bring in evidence as to that. Correct. So that premise is we're on the same page. Yes. So here's my question, and it really is basically in two parts. If we interpret the language of the statute, it says um, communications made, materials created, I'm reading part B of 2238, communications made, materials created for or used, and acts occurring during mediation are confidential and may not be discovered or admitted into evidence unless one of the exceptions is met. So my question becomes, and it's sort of a goose and gander type of question, if you understand. If the statute applies and it says all of those things are not admissible, how does your client get to testify about those things? And the second part to that question is, if she doesn't get to testify to that unless there's an exemption. 
the exemption is one, the only exemption I think that can uh, can apply is that um, uh, is under is one B one. All the parties to the mediation agree to the disclosure. Um, where's the agreement in this case, and who has to agree? Right. The first uh, question, my answer is yes, my client can testify, and that's why I believe that there are two privileges at play at a mediation whenever counsel is involved. You don't check your attorney-client privilege at the door, so to speak, when you approach a mediation. And so even those conversations where counsel is present, uh, they, if they occur geographically at the location of a mediation, are still susceptible to waiver under the attorney-client privilege. My position. And, and I guess everybody agrees. If you, if the client sues the lawyer, they're waived. Right, and even those conversations. The, the attorney-client privilege is waived. The attorney-client privilege is waived, and even those conversations only between an attorney and a client at a mediation would be discoverable notwithstanding the language of the statute that you that you focused on there. Why are these mutually exclusive? It seems to me that we're co or overlapping. It seems to me you've got an attorney-client privilege that, okay, those you're conceding, those, co those communications, if they meet the attorney-client privilege, are waived. But then this doesn't say, the, the 2238 doesn't say, unless some other privilege has been waived. It just doesn't have any exemption. So it just seems to be cumulative to say, well, even if the attorney-client privilege is waived, this doesn't come in. These, these things do not come in. If there are any, any, any communications made, materials created for or used, and acts occurring during a mediation are inadmissible unless all the parties agree. Right. And, and that's where I, I have to draw a distinction between the attorney-client privilege and events occurring at a mediation and the mediation privilege, such that the mediation privilege would not apply to those particular communications between the attorney and the client. So what communications? Define the communications it wouldn't apply to. Let's say the mediator introduces herself to the parties, goes, has a discussion about the merits of the case, goes to the other side and in its completely separate conference room. The attorney and his or her client is left alone in the room. They talk about the case. They talk about risks of going to trial. They talk about things like that. Those communications, I contend, are not only subject, are subject to the attorney-client privilege that can be waived, discovered in a subsequent malpractice suit, even though they technically, technically occurred at a mediation. Well, in fact, they occurred in the course of the mediation. At the mediation, in the course of the mediation. I think there is a definition that, that the mediation proceedings, the definition uh, applies to discussions with a, uh, a neutral third party. So the definition in subsection G, mediation means a process in which parties who are involved in a dispute enter into one or more private settlement discussions outside of a formal court proceeding with a neutral third party to try to resolve the dispute. Let me ask you a question. Is the preparation of a pre-mediation memorandum protected by the mediation privilege? Arguably it is, but there's an exception. It's certainly not geographically. You keep saying it's geogra the privilege is geographical. Only for those communications that are occurring at the settlement conference. Okay, but so wait a minute. So the communications that occur at the settlement conference are privileged. The preparation of the pre-mediation memo back at the attorney's law office two weeks prior, probably ten days before the mediation, is that privileged? Yes. Are the discussions he has with the client in regard to what goes into that memorandum privileged? Yes. I guess I'm, go ahead, Judge, because I'm losing they're, where, they're where privileged. Under which privilege? Exactly, that's the next question. Well, under, under, which under potentially right. both. But there's an exception under the mediation privilege that allows for discovery of those, those materials. Um, it says, subsection C, except pursuant to the subsection B with the other uh, exemptions, evidence that can exist independently of the mediation even if the evidence is used in connection with the mediation, is subject to service of process or subpoena. Right. So that's where the pre-mediation brief discussion conference that occurs two weeks before could be discoverable because it's independent of the mediation. But it's part of the process of the mediation. It, I mean, it is. And if, I mean, how do you, where do you draw the line? I mean, if they, if, if, if they have a discussion outside the mediator 
outside the mediation room. You know, you have that whole range of they may meet two weeks ahead of time to develop a mediation strategy, and they may up to right up to the you know the point before they enter the room to meet with the mediator. Where do you draw that line? And 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 the second point is, seems to me that's more along the line. That exception is more along the lines of the uh, discussion in Samaritan Foundation v. Superior Court, which says, just because you give something to your attorney, doesn't mean that it's privileged. It, you know, you can't take evidence, and that's what it says. It says evidence, you can't take evidence, and then say, oh, now that I gave you, know, I witness a car accident, okay, and I have the following witnesses. And, and this is a list of witnesses, and I give it to the attorney. It's not like those witnesses, you know, can't, or, or that, that information, the information, the communication is privileged, but not the underlying it. thing. Right. So I don't see where that really applies here. One, we can't draw a line, and two, I think that's aimed at the evidence. But if I understand your argument, your argument is, right, let me make sure I understand this. You're saying that because of the definition under G1, only communications would the mediator are protected by the statute? The mediation process. That's why I said arguably that example is covered. A mediation brief prepared two weeks before arguably could be covered by the mediation privilege because it's part of the mediation. But I think you've identified ex the exact problem with the ruling in this case is that where do you draw the line? Because in this case, we really don't have a proper or adequate factual basis to, to draw the line in this case. And, and I argued below this was premature, and I agree with you completely, because all of those ish questions are probably going to be factual issues in the case. But then how, ultimately, the trial court will have to apply the law to the facts. Right. But the problem I still have is, if your client has a communication with the attorney, with her attorney, mm -hmm. in the process of the mediation, meaning even preparing the mediation statement. And the statute says those communications are inadmissible. How does she get to testify? That's why I, I, I contend you have to draw a distinction that there are two privileges in play. One doesn't supersede the other. And so if you don't accept where that, that... Where do you get that from the statute? Pardon me? Where do you get that from the statute? The statute doesn't say you know, unless the attorney-client privilege is waived, it says it's it's absolute. Um, or if the disclosure is required by statute. As a matter of fact, not only is it absolute, it appears to me that even the agreement, even B-1 says agreement to the disclosure. They don't, it doesn't say you can agree to make it admissible. It just agrees to the disclosure. So it seems to me there's an absolute prohibition of your client introducing evidence of any communication she had with Ms. Lawrence as part of the mediation process. And, and I'm hanging my hat on the language that says if there is other evidence independent of the mediation is admissible or discoverable, even if it's used in the mediation. That's the only specific language in the statute uh, for that basis. The uh, second sentence of sub C. Correct. Uh, on, as long as we're on this issue, and all, I, I, I want to allow you to get to other issues if you'd like as well, uh, but the, the sub B of this statute says the mediation process is confidential. Uh, is it significant, or, or perhaps you'll argue it's not significant, that the language is the mediation process is confidential as opposed to simply saying the mediation is confidential? Well, I think the language is intended to be broad to cover acts uh, to, to be not so narrow in defining mediation because a mediation does not always conclude in one uh, occasion. The mediator will make follow-up phone calls, exchanges back and forth with days, weeks afterwards. And I think the statute is intended to cover that process, recognizing it's not just one day, two hours in the afternoon. So I think my argument still applies recognizing that broad definition of what mediation process. So if it's post-mediation, it would also be pre-mediation? Yes, I, again, you walk out of that mediation and two weeks later your client comes to you and you, you're saying, we need to try to call that mediator back and see if we can't jump start these discussions. Let's talk about what we do. Arguably that is covered by the mediation 
and then your attorney picks up the phone and says, hey, mediator, you know, I really think this that phone call, that discussion would be covered by the mediation process. But I also believe there's an attorney-client privilege uh, in play there between the attorney and the client that can be waived and discoverable. Uh, you know, and I think I forgot to say when we started that if you want to reserve some of your time, it's up to you, and we'll try to honor your whatever. I you do prefer. want to reserve three or four minutes. I still have six and a half minutes left, so I'll. Do you, <laughs> you do. And I've got to ask something I wanted to ask earlier. The you, you're talking about the fact that the uh, there are these two privileges. It sounds to me like what you're saying is your client can waive the attorney-client privilege, but can demand the integrity be maintained of the mediation privilege. If she alone is the hold out the statute provides for a way for all the other participants to consent to disclosure who are, who are those key. people that must under the statute and we're talking about the b1 the number one exception under b i think uh, who all are those people who must consent all the parties which would also include the party's counsel so not only the mediator uh, but I, I i think there's a logic to what you just said but i'm not sure how you get there from the language of the of the of the statute all of the parties no. It, says, it says all of the parties to the mediation. I, right. Well, I, so, well, well one, one way to interpret that would be to say that includes everybody who participated in it, right. which would include the lawyers. Right. Another way to look at it would be to say that includes the, the party litigants and maybe, and maybe the mediator, but not the lawyers. No, I, I, I think it means all of the above. The party litigants, the party litigants counsel, the mediator, the mediator staff. What's your authority for that? I, I don't. This, there's no authority under this statute, so I think a party is just. I mean, except for Cal California case, seems to have a broader definition of who can, who's entitled to hold a privilege or waive a privilege or agree to something. But is but, there any authority from anywhere under a statute like this that says the attorneys are parties to the mediation? Are parties to the mediation? I, I, I can't quote you any, but I, I would suggest that the attorneys are the agents of the parties. But doesn't that mean that they're not the holders of the privilege? They simply represent the party for purposes of exercising the privilege or communicating their client's waiver of the privilege. I, I would agree with that as an interpretation of that, that they that unilaterally cannot waive the attorney uh, in this the, case, the privilege. In this case, if you needed to get a, the, if you needed to get the, the, the consent the waiver right. of all of the parties to the litigation, does that mean you'd have two parties, a mediator, and two sets of counsel that would have to agree to waive? Five, five waivers? I, I think that the party litigant would have the authority to direct his attorney to waive the privilege. So if it were necessary to have another signature, I think it could be accomplished. But wait, are you saying that they would direct their attorney on their behalf or would that attorney have the right independently as a party to exercise his right to refuse to allow the mediation to be, uh, the privilege to be waived? It's, it's an interesting distinction that I'm not prepared with a case law to cite to you. I don't think it's part of our case. I don't case. think there is any counsel, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> to you. I don't think it's part of our case, but I will note, I think it's... But it is part of your case if the claim is that, that counsel... Uh, counsel is, is was a was a party to the mediation and has a protectable privilege there. Um, then it does bring in the issue of whether or not that person would have to agree to waive or that person could agree to waive. I well, mean, that, that counsel is the one urging waiver. I'm talking about the other party's counsel who's not a part of this. That that the issue of that waiver hasn't come into so, play yet. So your position would be that. If you sue your attorney for malpractice as part of the mediation process and they want to get disclosure of the mediation of what happened in the mediation from the mediator, you can veto that. You can veto, you can veto that yes. simply by not agreeing and say, fine, I can bring in all the testimony I want to bring in from your client mm -hmm. about what happened and what didn't happen in mediation. And you attorneys can, Ms. Lawrence, you can bring in whatever, you can testify to whatever you want but nothing else comes nothing else comes in nothing else from the mediator or the mediation materials but the other evidence that would be independent would come in but yes that's the, the like i said the discussions about settlement the discussions about strengths of a case the weaknesses of a case all those discussions that lead to a mediation how about a mediation document 
mediation statement that's going to, or a chart that's going to be submitted to the arbit to mediate, made prepared for the mediation, which is covered by the document, covered by the statute. You're saying that comes in anyway? That's, that's disclosable? It depends on the document, but arguably under my theory, yes. If it is evidence independent of the mediation by virtue of the attorney-client privilege, let's talk about this. So, this is what so, we're going to so prepare. If your client prepared a chart, if, you're, if Ms. Lawrence prepared a chart, right. not your client, and everybody agreed and it was submitted to the mediator, mm -hmm. and she doesn't have a copy of it, right? she can't introduce it because she doesn't have a copy of it. She doesn't have a copy of it. Okay. That's right, and that's what the standard of care requires her to do. So uh, I have a minute left, and I would like to conclude <laughs> that there's going to be prejudice no matter when, whenever a privilege is applied. In this case, it's important to remember two things. The trust of a mediator with the party litigants is crucial here. Parties will not participate if they don't believe that that trust of confidentiality is going to be maintained, and mediators won't want to participate either if they know that they're going to be taking sides. Second of all, this this evidence would not have existed but for the mediation. In other words, they have a duty, she had a duty, Ms. Lawrence, to, to document her file, prepare evidence, to support her action, in this case, irrespective of the mediation. What, what, what attorney would be involved in a mediation if they said, if they found, if they, if we ruled that anything you do as part of the mediation is, you can be sued for, but you can't get a mediator to, unless, the, unless your, your client agrees, you can't get a mediator to come in and say what happened. I think it's the opposite. What lawyer would go into a mediation without having explained the, the risks and benefits of the case to the client? Yeah. But I mean, what before mediator would say, let's do mediation when they're subject to, all I can do is it's a he said, she said type of situation, and I can't get any independent evidence unless my client agrees it and my client can veto that. I think it's the other way around. You have to be prepared as an attorney beforehand to know what you're doing. Other other question is, and I know you're out of time, but uh, what's the basis to seal this record? Uh, seal, seal these, not the record, but seal seal what you what what's been filed with us. Right, uh, the case arises out of a, a marital dis dissolution with uh, the Harkins family. Harkins business information, tax returns, confidential information uh, is part of the case. Part of the underlying case was a confidentiality agreement that if anybody said anything. Uh, that disparage the other party, a, a, a sanction of $10,000 could be levied against the other. My client is worried that the, even the bringing of a lawsuit or talking about this in public exposes her to a risk of a $10,000 sanction, which Ms. Lawrence drafted and was part of and is part of our claim. And so we feel compelled to urge the matter be sealed to protect her from any risk of a $10,000 fine for each publication. So if, she's, if there's a publication two or three times, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. It's so very great. In other words, by agreement of the parties, you can seal a public record? Require us to seal a public record? No. We, we believe that the court should under these circumstances. I don't think we are, uh, we don't have the authority to force this court to do it. But those are the factual circumstances underlying this entire case that supports and counsel, it. Counsel, so I understand. You're saying that by the bringing of this appeal, there stands to be a violation of this provision that would result in a monetary fine? You don't, want to, you don't want to run the risk. Potentially, uh, in divorce cases, there's emotions on both sides, and, and, and uh, even we're a not claim, talking, we're successful not talking, claim. We're not talking about going to the papers in the middle of the divorce case. What I'm talking about is you said the bringing of this of this appeal in and of itself could, be, it could result in a violation. If the ex-husband believes that there is anything disparaging, then yes. Thank in you. any public statement. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. Thank Sorry you. we didn't have more time. Thank you. Ms. Barnes. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sarah Barnes for the, and I, I repeatedly through my documents call them appellees. And I realize it's the real parties and interest, so if I slip and. Just call Ms. Lawrence. Ms. Lawrence, yeah, perfect. It, it, um, I yeah, wanted to, be, and bad, of course, probably. as it happens with these things, you know, I have this uh, big long all on, but a lot of the questions that were just presented to Mr. Briggs are, I really want to address at the outset. Um, the first, and I think it was the last question asked by uh, Judge Kessler, is what attorney wants to go into a mediation knowing that their conversations can be used against them, but then they're not able to utilize anything else that happens in the mediation. There's this like twofold. Well, they, uh, could, they could deny, they could clarify, they could explain. So 
differently. They could deny their, their own sort of self-serving statements versus these other self-serving statements when there is actually the ability of a neutral party to present testimony or a neutral party to present documents such as here's the case and the, the chart is discussed. There's this chart that was presented. But if, but if the allegation is in the course of the mediation at a specifically um, inappropriate time, you gave me really inappropriate advice, does the attorney then get to say, no, I didn't, this is what actually took place? Or does a discussion of the mediation and what took place in the court of, uh, course of the mediation violate the privilege? Well, I think that's just depending on how you look at it. And, and what, what I think Mr. Briggs is presenting at the outset of his argument and your questions just demonstrates how they're trying to have it both ways. There's no basis in the statute, the language, or any case law to suggest that you can carve out certain aspects of this process and the communications and allow them to be discoverable one and admissible two, whereas all these other portions then are protected. And so you can use it for your purposes to say, here's what I, here's, here's where she didn't advise me correctly, here's what was said to me, et cetera. But then she cannot go to the process and bring in other things that were looked at, reviewed, utilized, comments that Ms. Uh, Grubaugh or the, the petitioner may have made in the presence of, of others, et cetera. None of that's fair game. And that is exactly the type of sort and shield uh, tactic that our courts are against. And I think that that's what the trial court in the underlying ruling was still trying to accomplish. While the language utilized throughout that ruling, albeit a short one, may have not been as clear as, as could be, I do think that the discussion leading up to the last couple of conclusory sentences in the ruling still suggests that what the court was trying to to show is that there was this implied waiver by the petitioner as to anything being said where she's talking. But of course, the implied, I guess the implied waiver, you're talking about a common law idea of implied waiver, um, which I'm not sure applies. I don't even know if it applies to a statutory privilege that didn't have a common law existence. This is a problem because this is a statutory confidentiality statute that doesn't isn't premised on a isn't codifying the common law privilege with all the waivers issues and seems to have within the four corners of the document only four exemptions. Um, I guess one problem that I've got with this though is just to move on is it seems to me that what the opposing counsel has said is well if there is evidence that it under C, if there's evidence that, in, that, that exists independent of the process, even if it's used in the process, it's not covered by the confidentiality statute. And that's why he's arguing that any communications between Ms. Lawrence and Ms. Grubaugh in preparing for the mediation or in preparing documents for the mediation, if I understood his argument, would be covered if it's, if it, if it's because it's independent of the of the um, of the mediation itself is covered by the protection. Why is why is that the case? Well, if I can, if I can address the first concern that you raised first, which is whether or not there's an implied waiver when you're dealing with a statutory privilege, we have cited case law in the brief: the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter Day Saints case, the Bain case. There are cases that definitely indicate that statutory waivers, even if they include specific parameters for waiver within the statute, can still be subject to the common law waiver principle. Those were all represented codification of the statutory, of the common law privilege, like pr the privilege of the attorney-client privilege. Common law privilege, implied waiver was, was, was a common law, and then they codified the, the, what the privilege meant. It doesn't, but here there's nothing. There's no precursor. So. Well, there may not be a precursor in the sense uh, of the, the, those particular, those other particular privileges, but it nonetheless is called a privilege. It's an evidentiary privilege. That's what the statute is. That's what it amounts to. So it's the same in effect. Do we need to get to whether there's an implied waiver if, 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 we, if we hold that the statute applies and that all of the evidence related to anything that was discussed to the communications 
and anything with for in the process in in getting ready for the mediation in preparing for the mediation in uh, preparing documents for use in the mediation all of those things and that would be up to the trial court to determine which is which is inadmissible or inadmissible by anybody do we need to get to the implied waiver we don't and that was the basis for our alternative uh, argument in the underlying motion which is if if this is this confidential uh, protection that isn't subject to an implied waiver along the lines of the statute in California which is reads more broadly it does use the word participants not parties here in this statute it clearly says parties and parties at the outset of the statute are referred to as the as those who are submitting their their dispute to mediation so this the correlation there is that parties are just the litigants in the underlying litigation. But nonetheless, going back to what you said, yes, if you find that this statute is similar to that in California that the Supreme Court and Castle, how, how they treated it, which is everything's off limits, then no, we don't need to get to this other, the other idea of waiver. It's the alternative basis, and all of it goes out, and then that's why we ask for any allegations or claims based on any of those communications to be struck. When you say everything, meaning everything related to preparing for and conducting the mediation. Correct. Up to the point where the settlement conference is, you know, there's a settlement entered into. All of that related to the mediation would be protected. And then we'd leave that to the, obviously, if we did that, we'd have to leave it to the trial court to figure out. What's what? What's what. And then maybe either a motion limine, a motion for summary judgment, striking pleadings. That's up to the trial court. But, but you know, it would have that discretion. That yeah, and, that, and those sorts of things, those in that context, and uh, under that type of ruling, then some of those things may need to be later decided. We're not, we're not saying that that's not the case, but, but yes, if all those things related to preparation for, and I mean the the wording is that communications made, materials created for or used, and acts, any acts occurring during a mediation are confidential, and not only are not discoverable but not admissible, mm -hmm. and so if that is the case, then that's something the trial court will have to determine. During what? the mediation, mean you know after after you arrive at nine o'clock and it starts. Does, well, it, does it include uh, private conferences between a client and lawyer uh, in preparation for the mediation? What is the process of mediation? Well, I think that the pro the, well the, they do just define that mediation broadly as just presenting with this neutral party and and trying to resolve the issue, but it does specifically lay out things made created for, used in, acts occurring. So it's the mediation statement, the, the conversations that you're sitting there before the mediator walks into the room. The way Mr. Briggs would have you rule is before the mediator ever walks into the room while you're sitting there at the mediation that was scheduled to start at 9, if she doesn't show up until 9.30 to mediate the case, anything you say between 9 and 9.30 is okay, and that's going to be allowed, but anything at 9.30, once she's there, doesn't. What, I don't think about, it covers that. What about a week in advance? And we're not talking about preparing the mediation statement. We're, we just have lawyer consulting with client. I think if lawyer is consulting with client in, and they, in preparation for the mediation. Well, again, if if you're if you're clarifying that it's in preparation for the mediation, they're discussing the strategy for the mediation, what what the various items to be discussed were are going to be, what the concerns are. Then I think that still falls within that uh, umbrella. If it's something completely outside of that, there are issues in his complaint or in Ms. Grubaugh's complaint that don't have anything to do with um, things that were settled in the mediation, things that were addressed in the mediation, fine, that's not going to be covered. But a lot of it was, and all of that should be protected if that's the way we're going to view this statute. Uh, I think that, again, the trial court looked at it slightly differently and, again, applied this you know, waiver concept, even though it was worded differently than that. What does C mean? Does that last sentence mean? Evidence independent. Evidence, excuse me. Evidence that exists independently of the media, of mediation, even if it's used in connection with mediation. Well, what does that relate to? It can't, it can't mean conversations between the lawyer and the client about settling at a mediation. It doesn't exist independently. There's no, there's no, at least in the general view of things, there's no reason to think that that conversation that's talking about what's going to occur at the mediation as far as settlement would have existed if it weren't for the fact that they were going to mediation. So let me give you an example. Let's assume your client meets with her client as part of the, in preparation for mediation. And Ms. 
Grubaugh tells Ms. Lawrence, you know, I was talking to my Mr. Harkins, and he told me Cine Capri's worth $10 billion. <laughs> um, that's a hypothetical. hypothetical. Almost. Almost. Um, that statement, that alleged statement that it was worth $10 billion, would be evidence that independently exists independently of the mediation. That wouldn't become inadmissible or privileged unless it was an independent privilege involved. It would, but, it, but, as, but if it's used as part of the mediation, the use of it, you know, the mediation, it doesn't, doesn't protect it. Doesn't, right? Am I right? Right, but it's not protected otherwise. There's I, I'm saying that. It's not, not protected otherwise. Right. There's no other, there's no other uh, not independently privileged or confidential. Um, uh, you know, let's assume the Harkins LLC or whatever it is prepared, you know, had financial statements. And she said, oh, I looked at financial statements and it shows it's worth $10 billion. Um, but those financial statements don't become, even if you have, she has a copy of it and gives it to her attorney, those don't become confidential. But is that right? Correct. Okay. So that's all that relates to. Right. Okay. Right. But if she's then in preparation for the mediation, taking some of those facts into account and then saying, well, if, if he says it's worth $10 billion and, and there's this valuation that says it's worth this, and but you have the risk of being um, exposed to liability for reimbursement under this, you know, Ruchenberg analysis or whatever, and you're, you're doing these, you're having these conversations and then saying when we get to the mediation. That would all be inadmissible. Correct. Okay. You've uh, obviously reviewed the Castle case from California. You cited it to us. Yes. Uh, the statute is different. What would you what would you share with us this afternoon as to why we should apply that or should not apply the, the and how far the, should we apply uh, yeah apply the same reasoning and analysis I think if you view that and what you addressed earlier with me if you view this statute our statute 12-2238 to be an all encompassing mediation protection statute that is not a privilege that arises out of common law, that cannot be a privilege that uh, is subject to an implied, a common law implied waiver. If, if you view it as such, then it is identical really to the heart of the California statute. The California statute has a little bit more, goes a little bit uh, more in depth, but the analysis of the Castle case would then apply equally to our statute, which is the whole process is protected and not, you can't divvy it out and decide that one person can can carve out this portion to be not privileged and admissible, this portion still is privileged and discoverable but not admissible. You can't do all this carving. If it's this overarching basis for protecting settlement, promoting mediation, et cetera, which is what the Castle Court focuses on throughout the opinion, then our statute, the decision should be the same, which is, Anything related to the mediation, the way our statute is worded, communications made, and again, this is something the trial court will have to determine, communications made, materials created for, or used in acts occurring during a mediation are confidential and may not be discovered or admitted, period. Now, all of that's protected. The litigant bringing the professional malpractice can't use anything related to those communications to support allegations or claims against the former lawyer, those claims and allegations must be struck. Now, in this situation, that will carve out certain claims of, of in this particular case and not others because there are arguments that have nothing to do with the mediation. But anything related to the mediation, something that needs to be defined probably more clearly, um, that should be covered and the treatment should be the same. Right. <laughs> we all started to talk at one time. Uh, I, uh, I select me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I've, we ran out of time for me to ask Mr. Briggs this, but I have time to ask you. Uh, in your research, did you happen to, to discover any uh, uh, statutes from outside Arizona that were similar to ours from which guidance one way or another might be, might be gleaned? We did, and that would be, well, there's the Florida statute, but but primarily the Texas statute, and the case that we cited was the Alfred versus Bryant case, and the statute is not only similar, the facts are virtually identical. It is a, a litigant from a 
prior case that settled at a mediation, suing the former lawyer, saying that they were improperly advised, not fully informed, uh, not advised of risks, benefits, et cetera, all the same, sort of the same claims that are here. And there the court held that waiver applied. So their view of it was, and that's why we have these alternative, you know, uh, motions that we're making. So it's either we're going to look at it, and, and the, the country is split. I'll, it's not something I cited, but there's, a, there's an article that discusses this. There is a split about how to look at these mediation statutes and what they mean today and how they're... What's the site? Uh, the site. Let me just grab it. And I'll, I'll send you a copy. Uh, it is the by Morgan Lewis. It's the frailty. Thy name is privilege. Mediation, confidentiality, and its jurisdictional challenges. And it's by Scott Garner and Sean Kennedy from the American Bar Association. And it's dated April 6th through 9th, uh, 2011. Is there, a, is there a formal citation like a, does it appear in the ABA Journal or something else, or is it just? It does. It does not give that. It only gave. It was only presented uh, the way I found it was via you know in the form of this article. Uh, but, but the reason I bring it up is really just for, for background to illustrate the difference between the Texas situation and the California situation, and which is there they determined that implied waiver, common law implied waiver, would apply to the mediation statute. That statute was but, almost well, the same as ours. There's a different statute, right? Say there that again. A different statute there. They, 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 in, in, as I understood the Texas case, there were two different statutes, and one talked about offensive use. Well, uh, well, it's, there's two different. Oh, I'm sorry. So one one said you can't. You've waived it if you've done certain things. There's two different statutes covering oral communications and written communications. And what the Texas court held is anytime you're using it offensively, which is what's the case there and which is the case here, mm -hmm. then then you, you're you waiving it under the implied waiver. If, if you're bringing a lawsuit against your lawyer who advised you in this mediation, claiming that they ill advise you in the mediation, that's an offensive use, and whatever communications occurred as a result of the mediation could be dispositive of the defenses of the lawyer, the underlying lawyer. And so that's the same. And so that's the, that's the first argument that we make versus viewing it, if you view it uh, the way the California court has viewed it. And so I would argue that it does extend, if you view it in the latter lens, then the Castle case should be applied with equal force to our statute. Did, in your research, did, did you, no, go ahead. In your research, did you run across the Uniform Mediation Act? I did. Was that that was that was that sort of promulgated after Arizona's legislature um, per, um, created the? Uh, 2238? I believe it was created after. It's also something that other states have used. The Hawaii has based their statute on the Uniform Mediation Act statute. And the, the Uniform Mediation Act does have that carve out to mm -hmm. the extent you're trying to use this um, for purposes. When was the UMA, UMA, as we've referred to it in the conference? I uh, do you know don't know when that was promulgated? I don't have the site here. I apologize. It was uh, included in our. Uh, Supplemental authority submitted to the court before oral argument, so I probably reference it in the oral argument in the appendix. So, when other counsel comes back up, I can uh, look in my appendix in my argument and try to find the exact the legislature site. Legislature amended. I just noticed the amend legislature amended 2238 in 2010, um, at least according to to my version of it. And it it sounds like if they had wanted to include any. Anything that was in the UMA that could have, if the UMA was already out there. I, I don't think that it was. I, I, I will have to double check that. I, I, I want to say that it was 2000, the, late uh, 2011, but I, I would have to double check that. Yeah, but the amendment was pretty, in 2010, was pretty modest, well, I think, yeah. yeah. Right. But again, the, the, that in that, in the Uniform Mediation Act, there's this carve out, and then, like I said, other states follow and include that. If it's for lawyer malpractice cases, then all bets are off. Well, we don't have that here, right. um, and I'm, my, I'm not positive of the year. But my point was that if the legislature knew about that and didn't amend it in light of the Uniform Act, maybe it didn't intend to have that. But other question, just I know you're out of time, was the is issue of confidentiality. And Se sealing of the documents, do you have a position on that? Our, our posi we don't have a position. We're, we're fine either way with the court decides. And it, may I just have 10 seconds to 15 seconds to wrap up? 15. All right. I just want to say that whether you view
however the court's uh, ruling, the underlying ruling is viewed, it should still be affirmed for its correctness if you view it as implied waiver uh, applying. If not, then our alternative argument is not a cross appeal. It is just a cross issue. It's appropriate for this court to rule on that or remand for the trial court to rule. It's not something that we needed to present via cross appeal. And striking of the allegations consistent with Castle's treatment of the California statute is appropriate. Thank you both very Thank much. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, I know you'd love to have some more time, but we're, but we're out and we need to make way for the next group. We will, uh, we will uh, uh, likely be accepting jurisdiction, taking this matter under advisement with decision to follow, hopefully not too long thereafter. Thank you both very much, Mr. Briggs, Ms. Barnes, Mr. Meyer.